Hey guys, welcome back to another exciting episode of Is It Wrong? And I just want to say before we get started, I want to thank you for everyone who subscribes and shares and just all the all the love that we've been getting. It's because of you guys that we're doing so well. And uh, today, uh, I have a real special guest, uh, Rudy Sarzo. I, I don't even have to say his name. You can see his face and you know who he is. Uh, Rudy's had an, an illustrious career uh, in the music industry, playing with so many bands. He's part of Quiet Riot. Ozzy, Whitesnake, Dio, and so on and so on and so on. And he's got some stories, and uh, we just want to share some time with him. And ladies and gentlemen, Rudy Sarzo. How are you, Rudy? I'm blessed. How are you doing, Ray? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing I'm, I'm excited we're finally doing this. Yeah. Yeah, this is good. I've seen, I've watched a lot of your interviews, and I've, I've learned a lot about you, you know, and uh, it's just really neat. It's neat to see, you know, all the things that you've done. I have, uh, I have a whole thing of questions here I want to ask you. So um, I'm just going to kind of hit some and, 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 you know, just elaborate as you like. But the biggest one for me was, you know, being a, a, a Latino, a Cuban, what got you into the, the rock and roll? I know you don't like to call it metal scene, but what got you into that kind of music initially? That's a really good question. I think it was more of a political uh, significance it's a political meaning that I, I we my family moved from cuba to the united states in 1961 because of the castro revolution and there was a lot of oppression and rock and roll always symbolized to me freedom freedom to express yourself you know rebellion the kids rebelling from the old guard changing things you know uh, having a youthful, open-minded, and uh, and lyrically, it was to me the most important form of you know genre of music. Mm -hmm. uh, lyrically, I say lyrically because let's say I, I love jazz, but jazz traditionally is more instrumental. You know, if you listen to like a lot of Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, Miles Davis, it's all instrumental music. So it, it, it has the freedom to explore the 12 notes that were given in our Western scale with a lot of freedom to move around. But, but you find out that everything, all the notes are connected, especially if you go in fifths. If you go from, you know, from C, C to, uh, to G and fifths and then so on, you move on, you wind up in C again after you hit the 12 notes, you know, in fifths. Right, right. So it's all, so it's all connected. It's, it's part of the, uh, what do you call that? I was watching a video the other day about it. The, uh, it's like the resonance, the harmonic, mm -hmm. the harmonic uh, scale, you know, the scale of, of all the harmonic intervals being, uh, being played. And, uh, and what's interesting about it is that that harmonics that we're talking about, it's not, it's done it's the the notes are scattered and and they're not in um, equal intervals you know so you know the traditional in, in the intervals that we have let's say in, in the ski uh, in the uh, in the uh, major scale it's mm -hmm. not like that it's all scattered but when you put them together in sequence it becomes the uh, the major scale you know yeah yeah so uh, so you know so again you know the uh, 12 notes a lot of freedom rock and roll what what's crazy about rock and blues is that once you start playing dominant chords, one you know let's say uh, from 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 G to C dominant, and then you go to to down you know to one four five progression, then you go to the D D dominant that leads you back to the G. So mm -hmm. that's why you know when we were kids growing up musically. Everybody jammed. We did blues jams. There were different tempos and everything, but it was that that you could actually explore your musical vocabulary uh, mm. endlessly 
just a, with three chords, you know. Yeah, yeah. So prior prior to you getting into the rock and roll, did you ever play any Latin music, or was that ever in your family at home, or not? Not really. I, I grew up listening to Latin jazz because I was born in 1950, and that that was very popular uh, musical form in Cuba. Uh, it was between the big bands that had really big arrangements, you know, just like. Count Basie's band or Duke Ellington's band, you know, would have some really nice, really uh, dense harmonically, you mm -hmm. know, re uh, chords and, and chord changes and very, very rich, you know, and uh, even even for, for the big bands. And then you had the uh, more of the combos, the, uh, the jazz, Latin jazz combos in mm -hmm. Cuba. And uh, so I grew up with that. As a matter of fact, every night I used to go to sleep. Uh, we live in an apartment in, in middle Havana. And uh, there would be kids gathering around a car that would be parked outside my window. And that would be like the social media meeting there and then grabbing, having coins and using the coins to play on the rims I mean, oh, this back wow. in the day, back in the day when car, every piece of the car was metal. Yeah. You know, play, play on the hood, play on the trunk, play on the rims, and then everybody would just join in. They, they, nobody would talk verbally. They would just communicate through music, you know, the yeah. rhythm, the rhythm sure. that they were playing. And it was a very interesting to fall asleep to that because it was not metronomic, you know, African-Cuban, I mean, African music, you know, the, the Afro-Cuban is a little bit different than the pure African music, but the African music that came directly from, from Africa to the Caribbean uh, was more ritualistic tribal. Oh, know, yeah. The drum, the drum circle. And they used that in religious, spiritual ceremonies. And it was more talking to the, high, the, the higher powers as they knew it. Mm. You know, and uh, when the Africans came to the Caribbean, they brought that with them, you know, and the uh, uh, the colonial, the Spanish colonial plantations allowed them to play it, but not in the United States, not the Anglo, except for a pocket in Louisiana, which were the French at the time. Mm -hmm. They allowed the Africans to to play, you know, their their music of origin. Yeah. Why do you think that, that was that they wouldn't let them do it? Oh, uh, if, uh, historically, I mean, I mean if, uh, it, the, the reason was because they wanted to <clears> avoid <throat> the Africans from uh, communicating from plantation to plantation and creating revolts. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. yeah, you learn something about cultures, you know, every time you, you think about music. Music speaks so much in so many ways you know yeah um for me I, I listen to a lot of that uh music as well i'm a metalhead i'm a singer in a band sacred warrior i don't know if ken told you but uh we we were started back in the 80s you know and just done the the christian metal scene and you know stuff like that but uh we never really made a crossover you know we we, we are who we are you know but uh, music's always been a big thing for us um and then I started listening to like Quiet Riot and White Snake and Ozzy, you know, as I got older. And then came this guy, Rudy Sarzo. I think I seen a video where Coverdale introduced you, and he's like, "This is the the most sexiest man alive." And you came up there and you were playing and stuff. Nice. The biggest sexual animal that I have personally ever met, Rudy Sarzo. I don't know if you remember that. It looks like you were pretty. You had the long blonde hair and everything else. But yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, we had a little sense of humor. Yeah, you know, with the music. You know, it, it, it was it, it was like inside jokes and things like that that we were that we were manifesting on stage. You know, sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I watch. Uh, I will watch a clip like that today and just laugh about it and go, "Oh God, that was crazy." <laughs>
know? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, you when you're on the road, you have to keep it light. Mm -hmm. Be have fun. Don't be that sour grape on the tour bus because you're not gonna get along with everybody. You know, everybody's away from home. We all have our stress factor because we miss our family, and uh, it's it, the road is very is very tough. Yeah, I know that. That's why I choose now to uh, you know I'm back with Quiet Riot and Quiet Riot. What we do is we go out on the weekends. <laughs> And then we're home. I'm home right now during the week. And uh, next week, I'll go back out again, you know, on the weekend. And mm -hmm. I get to be home, you know, yeah, which, yeah. which I love. You know, I've been doing this for this year. It's going to be 43 years of doing this. So I think my reward now is to be able to pick and choose how I want to travel. Yeah. And that was going to be one of the things I was going to ask is how you balance that personal life versus band. I know you guys, I think it was last year. You played at a mortal fest in Ohio, right? With Saint. That's Quiet Riot. Is uh -huh. that correct? Yeah. So we 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 play there a lot and we're gonna be yeah. playing there. We're gonna be playing there this year. But uh so separating your time from your family to your music, you just pretty much answered that question. It's like you get you get to pick and choose what you wanna do, right? So Oh yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. So let's go back to Quiet Riot then. Mm -hmm. Uh when when you guys formed the band, uh you, Randy Rose, and and all the guys. How did that come about? Uh, where you formed the band? Were they already a band and you joined them, or? Yeah, I. The band was basically created uh, between Randy and his high school buddy, uh, neighborhood friend uh, Kelly Kelly Garney, and then they found Kevin, and then they found Drew Forsythe, and those were like the four original members of that of what we call the Randy Rhodes era of Quiet Riot, and. Uh, the band had a couple of names before. I think one of them was Little Women, and then there was another. <laughs> Randy Randy had had a band with a guy named Smokey, you know. So you, you know how it is. I mean, it's it's not like a band to me. You know, starting out is kind of like you know the first girl you kiss is rarely going to become your wife. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's not the one that you're going to like settle with. You know, and so bands are like that. I mean, before. Before I ever played, let's say, Choir Riot or even Ozzy, I was in, in, I played with a lot of guys and girls, you know, bands uh, for at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. That's, oh, God, more, more than 10 years. But, you know, by the time that I was playing clubs, more than 10 years, well, I went through a lot of musicians, mm -hmm. you know, so it does it. So it's, it's, it's a long way to the to the moment that you actually get signed to a record deal, especially an American record deal, because the Randy Rose version of the band, they had a record deal, but it was only in Japan. And at the time, you might as well have a record deal in, you know, on the moon, because, yeah. <laughs> if you, you know, you cannot get airplay. If you can't get airplay because there's no domestic record label to promote your album to mm -hmm. add it to the radio stations and give you tour support that bands used to get back then you're you're nobody you're just a local band and that's what we were which is the reason why why randy left uh, to join ozzy because after two albums released in japan we were competing with the new sound Mm -hmm. of the late 70s which was new wave and punk and mm -hmm. record companies were not interested in us whatsoever so actually randy's mom advised them to like you know this this might be the only chance <clears throat> you're ever gonna get because you you know she could only advise him based on what was happening at the moment she had no idea that mtv was within three years or four years from happening and all she she was concerned about is her son's future as a professional musician. So when Randy was offered 
you know, the, the spot as Ozzy's guitar player, he accepted it. You right. know, it was his first time on a plane. Really? Yes. Yes. Wow. First time ever. And, and so uh, I'll tell you a little story that very few people know about. Yeah. Okay. So I, he leaves for England, you know, and a few days later, I call his mom, Dolores. And I ask her, have you heard from Randy? How is he doing? And she goes, oh, you mean he hasn't called you? I go, no, he's in England. And that costs a lot of money for him to call me. And he just says, no, he's home. <laughs> I go, really? Okay, so I called him up. And I said, Rand, what's going on? And he says, oh, so he tells me the story. Uh, so they put him on a plane. He goes to London. Doesn't give him any instructions. Uh, so he lands. And he's got his guitar. So they ask him, uh, what are you doing here? And Randy goes, well, I'm, I'm, I'm playing. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a band together with, with uh, Ozzy Osbourne, the singer from Black Sabbath. And they go, uh, where, where's your work permit? What's oh, that? Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so obviously he didn't have a work permit. So they put him in a holding pen. And they gave him one phone call to call the management record company office. And somebody answers the phone and they say, don't worry, we'll send somebody for you right away. Well, that never happened. So oh. then it, next, so he sleeps in this holding, <laughs> holding uh, cell, spends the night, and they put him on a plane the next day, the next morning, back to L.A., handcuffed. <laughs> Wow. That was, that was his experience, first experience on an airplane. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. You never forget that, man. Oh, no. 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 I mean, of course, you know, a few days later, Ozzy called him, apologized, and make sure that everything was uh, taken care of. And then yeah. he, he obviously left <laughs> for England. How soon after he, he left Quiet Right and joined Ozzy? Did he bring you along? Was it right away? Oh, or was it uh, okay, so he left in 79, and I joined in 81 after Blizzard and Diary of a Madman mm. were recorded. That's they great. did th Those two records were done back to back. They did Blizzard of Oz. They took a little break, did a little touring, went right back and did Diary of a Madman. They're two different wow. sounding records, you know. Oh, yeah, completely. And, mixes and everything yeah well you know what i've noticed about you um i've seen like i said i've watched a lot of interviews about you you really seems to know a lot about music composition theory and other it blows me away just some of the things that you talk about when i'm watching your podcast i think you did one with nikki six where you were just talking about playing certain notes and all that and i'm just like man that that guy knows a lot about music so did you take music lessons? You learned theory? Or is it something that just came natural to you? Oh, I, 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 I studied music in college. But uh, what, what happened was, uh, you know, I, I graduated from high school hmm. and immediately go to you know, went to the college and sign up. And I figure, you know, let me get the morning classes. That way I'll get it out of the way and I'll have the afternoon to do whatever I need to do. So... Right before we started the, the school uh, session, w the band that I was in, that was actually, we were playing quinceañeras, you know, quinceañeras. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We were doing that in Miami in that circuit. Uh, we went from quinceañeras to one day, you know, right, right as we were about to start the, uh, the, the college uh, year, <laughs> the, uh, we're rehearsing at the guitar player's uh, uh, house, and his dad shows up with the, an ad in the newspaper that says, club looking for a band, live band. So we went to audition. It turned out to be a topless oh. bar. <laughs> this is 1969. Oh, my okay. God. Did they have them back then, topless? Yeah, they were topless. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. In Miami. In Miami. Oh, yeah. Know, Miami. It's, yeah, it's, yeah it's, sure. Everything goes in Miami. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was called the Tomboy Club. Oh the topless God. tomboy club. And so we get the gig. We get so now I I don't have a car because I was counting on taking the bus that I had a bus stop like uh 
across the street from my house to, that, would, that would take me all the way to the school, the college that I was going to go in North Miami. So now I don't have a car yet. <clears throat> so I'm just taking buses. You know, we would come home like uh, around four o'clock in the morning and sleep for about two or three hours. And, and I would, you know, I'll grab the bus to go to school. And I was falling asleep. I, I, I couldn't keep my eyes open. I, so I tried to read, sight reading, and it was like, I can't see what, a, you know, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't even see the paper here, you know. Yeah. And, and one, one thing, and of course, this is not the, uh, this is not the school's uh, problem. It was my own that at the time I was playing at a level that was more advanced than the level that I was being taught. Oh wow! So it's like so it was like, you know, because you know, academia has a certain sequence of information that they sure. reveal to you once once you learn this, then you're ready for this and that and that and the other thing, you know, yeah. especially with, with with music, you know, and you learn the fundamentals and then it gets you know deeper into the theory and the harmony and all of that, and uh, so I was going like you know I was going through the fundamentals and I'm th and I'm, I'm thinking. I'm playing more advanced stuff than, than what I'm being taught here. And I got to get some sleep. So I, I changed my major in the middle of that semester to uh, mass communication. So I became a mass communication uh, major. And as a matter of fact, in 2020, I got inducted into the, um, uh, into the, the Hall of Fame of my school. Miami wow. Dade, Miami Dade wow. College, yeah, MDC. Wow, yeah, <laughs> that's impressive. That's impressive. So let's roll back to the whole Aussie thing. When I know I, I read somewhere, um, or I, I saw somewhere that you actually live with Sharon and Aussie for a while, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. So uh, that was while you were in the band, correct? Yeah. So while you were okay, did that did that help to? Uh, change your style of writing or your your way of thinking about stuff or what kind of impact did living with Ozzy and Sharon have on your life? Mm, that's a really good question. Uh, they were extremely kind and generous uh, and very protective. Mm. Kind of like oh, watch their own. Oh, no, no. Very protective. It, it was a very small circle of people. Mm. Not, not, not everybody was allowed in. The reason why I was allowed in initially was because they trusted Randy. Mm. You know, they call it the circle of trust. Mm. Only certain people get into that. It's a, it's a very small circle. Only so many people fit in there. And so if, so they, you know, I didn't have a resume. It wasn't like Sharon or Ozzy could call somebody, some other musicians who were professional musicians and say, hey, this, this guy, Rudy, you know anything about him? No, I was kind of like, I was the guy that was sleeping in Kevin Dubrow's bedroom floor on a sheet. And wow. uh, that, that was it. Yeah, and that I had played with Randy in Quiet Riot. So, <clears throat> so they trusted Randy. Randy already had gained their trust mm -hmm. with, his, with his integrity. Yeah, really, that, that, as the highest trust factor of anybody I ever met. Mm. Uh, so, so, you know, they took, they took his advice. Yeah. The Rudy, Rudy is the guy. So I went from sleeping on the floor the morning that I got the gig to play with Ozzy. I auditioned and Randy taught me the bass lines because <laughs> the record, they, they, they didn't have a record to play me or right. a cassette. This is like, they just got there and, uh, you know, and uh, okay, you got two songs, and they go like this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so then you know, I had to retain it, 
And then I had to go and practice a couple of times with Tommy and Randy and myself. And then Sharon and Ozzy showed up. I, we played her a couple of times. <clears throat> and then Ozzy goes outside, talks to Sharon. Then he comes back in and says to me, do you want the gig, man? <laughs> I said, yeah. Nice. nice. Do you remember what those two it's, songs were? The first yeah, two I, don't, songs I don't know and Crazy Train. Nice. Yeah. And uh, so... So, uh, so that, that was it. So yeah. then they invite me to go up to the house and, and Randy says to me, listen, you know, be very careful because they're going to test you. They, 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 they had no idea who I was, sure. of course. And there was so much writing on that tour. That was the first tour, in the United States, the, the family who, uh, Sharon's family, her dad, owned the record company and the management company and they put a lot of money to get the tour started you know and uh, it, there was a lot of pressure to make sure things went the right way upwards and so R randy goes you know they're gonna test you to make sure you know just so don't take anything and i told him, yeah i'm not i'm not I'm not taking anything yeah. you know, whatever they offer you you don't take and i said sure no problem so, so of course, you know, they're offering me stuff and says, no, 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 no thank you. And uh, so, so uh, Randy leaves <clears throat> and Sharon goes to bed, Tommy goes to bed and it's just me and Ozzy. And Ozzy takes a look at my clothes and he says, you need some rock, rock, rock and roll clothes, man. So <laughs> he leaves, goes to his room, comes back out with a suitcase. Oh my his, God. His suitcase. And he pours it on the pool table. And then there's all stuff, stuff that I recognize from album covers. You know, oh, like yeah, yeah. Especially cut. I, I, I couldn't believe it. And he goes, take whatever you want, man. And I go and I grab a couple of things. And then the next day we did a photo session. And that's what I'm wearing on this photo session. You know, jacket that Ozzy gave me. He gave me a, a, he gave me a couple of jackets. One was snake skin that basically, well, it was from the 70s. Black Sabbath period. It was a, uh, a snakeskin jacket that evaporated in my closet because after a while it just like shrunk. All the yeah. scales came off, you know. And the other one was a black leather jacket with some little rhin uh, diamonds, rhinestones. You know, it was really, yeah. really pretty. Beautiful jacket. And uh, so he was always generous, super generous from, 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 the, uh, from day one. Yeah. And and uh, so I was ready to go home, or at least go back to sleeping on the floor in Kevin's apartment. And and I asked him for a ride back back to Kevin's place. And and Ozzy said, "Oh man, I don't drive." But then he pointed at one of the uh, bungalows in the property, and he goes, "But but you can stay there." And I'm going like, "Okay." <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna find me here and kick me out you know <laughs> and uh so i go in this bungalow and it's beautiful and it had a real bed with a mattress and nice. i slept with my clothes on because i thought they were gonna find me and <laughs> and get me arrested or something so it's just i was ready for anything so i finally i fall asleep and then and then i hear a knock on the on the door and a sharon waking me up to go to breakfast with the family Wow. And I'm sitting there and right next to Don Arden, her dad, who's wearing his robe and he's yelling at somebody, some record company guy. And his dog, he had a uh, a uh, a Doberman, big Doberman named oh, Jet. Yeah. Jet, named after the record company. And he comes over and eats my eggs off the plate. <laughs> And and her dad goes, oh, Jed likes you. That's a good sign. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I went, okay. So it, by now, then you're you're in your head. You must be going. I'm in. I'm having breakfast with these well, guys. He's giving me his clothes. You no, know, I've never been that kind of guy. I am the kind of guy who auditions every single day. Ooh, that's good. Uh, the day that you feel that you're in. You're done. Yeah. You're yeah. out. You're you're really out. You're yeah. outing yourself. Yeah, no, that's you true. Know? 
Yeah, so every day I got to start all over again and take it to the next level. Yeah, you know, yeah. Not, not keep doing the same things. You know? Sure, yeah. But but take, so, take it, yeah. Yeah. So bring me back to Randy. Uh, we've heard so many things about, you know, mm -hmm. how, how he passed away with the, the plane wing clipping mm -hmm. the building and all that stuff. But prior to that, I mean, the time you guys spent together, he seems like yeah. such a genuine, incredible guy. Can, can you share a little bit about just sure. Randy? Yeah, just yeah. Randy uh, was <clears throat> the, the, the most unique musician I've, I've ever played with. Uh, he was born into a musical family, his mom and dad, music professors, who built a school brick by brick called Musonia. Mm. So Randy, at a very early age, five years old, he started playing classical guitar. He started reading music. He started learning composition, theory. Uh, he, was, he became a, an educated, well-rounded musician. Then he started teaching at Musonia. Mm -hmm. And by 1978, when I joined the band, uh, he invited me to teach at Musonia. And he taught me how to teach because I, you know, it's, it's different if you're teaching academia, which means that you got a book and you got a classroom and you tell the classroom, okay, today we got chapter six. We're going to learn minor intervals, you know, so you follow that. When you're going from student to student, their personal private lessons, and each one, you have to treat each one individually. You cannot treat, you know, by say treating, I mean the same information. All right, right. You cannot give it, you have to look at their level that they're at and take it from there to the, you know, help them get to the next level hmm. and answer all <clears throat> the questions doubts that they might have that are keeping them from progressing mm -hmm. because the, in, with music as you know the more you learn the more you questions you have about about music how how things work you know especially if you start going outside of diatonic play yeah you know, then then you start getting more into altered chords and and you know breaking all the rules and so, so it's like, wow. I mean, it's like, I, I go through it. I go to YouTube every single day and I take lessons. Really? You know, I, I, and during COVID, I did the full academia. I went through the whole thing. I got, I, wow. I, 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 st I basically I got a degree in music without a diploma. Because there, there's, there's a professor. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a professor <clears throat> on YouTube that has put out like a whole semester oh wow of music theory right and he had, he had a camera so it's the camera so each each uh reel you know each youtube lesson is one day of him teaching oh wow bam so you got you do that one day so you and how long were like, those uh the lessons yeah uh <clears throat> it depends there were at least an hour and a half each Wow. Yeah. So by the end of the sequence of all these lessons, you have learned. I mean, you know, you can actually learn it from a book, but to actually have a teacher explain it to you, it's a little bit different because then there's interaction with the students. So there's a student that might be asking a question that you have in your mind, and then the, the teacher will explain it. Mm. That's awesome. So then he brought you in to, to help teach with him, and then you guys played together oh, a lot. Yeah. And yeah, you guys yeah, got a good, real good bond. Well, yeah, you know I, that happened within about six months after I had joined Choir Riot. He brings me in, and the first six months, basically, my interaction with Randy was uh, pretty much just at rehearsals and gigs because he was busy um, teaching. You know, so once I started teaching at the school, <laughs> they were then we were hanging out together. And in between lessons, that's when I would hear him uh, play uh, classical guitar, which mm. I had no idea he could play like that. And, and I, I said, I, why don't you play, you know, class, something classical rock on, on, with Quiet Ryan? He says, now, you know, first of all, you know, bringing a, trying to mic a classical guitar at a club, it's not going to work. It's the feedback and all that. 
and then this doesn't fit <clears throat> with the type of music that we're doing. Right. So he, he was already, so when, so this is what happened because I asked him, so he joins Ozzy and he asked Ozzy, what do you want me to play? You know, to write. And Ozzy said, just be yourself. So nice. that's when it started like, you know, that's, that's the real Randy. You know, yeah, just man. start sticking classical, classical music, <clears throat> you know, classical guitar into your compositions. Yeah, yeah. And then from 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 Ozzy, you went to White Snake, and how, how long did that go on? No, I actually went to quite the metal health version of Quiet Riot. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when did the whole White White Snake thing come about? Was that prior to Ozzy? No, uh, after Ozzy. Well, Ozzy after. was a, a, <laughs> Ozzy was eighty one, eighty two, and I recorded the same week the Speak of the Devil Ozzy Life at the Ritz record, Speak of the Devil, uh, the Black Sabbath re recordings, mm -hmm. and half of my contribution to the Metal Health record the same week. Mm. And then I left Ozzy, and then I came. I the band was was called Dubro at the time. Then once I came back to the band, it got renamed Quiet Riot. Uh, and then okay. then I finished I finished the record, and uh, so that that was from okay. <clears throat> I recorded that eighty two. Then I left the band in eighty five, and then I joined White Snake in eighty seven. Mm, okay. And the last time I played in White Snake was 1994. Okay. So now you said you bring us back forward to today. You're you're still doing the Quiet Riot version of what you're doing, and you're just picking and choosing uh shows. And who's all in the band now? Well, it's not a matter, of, I mean, it's not a matter that we're picking and choosing shows. It's just a matter that when <clears> I when I see I, I went back to Quiet Riot in 1997 and even back then, we were not doing tour bus tours. With certain exceptions, there would be like, let's say, the uh, Rock Never Stop tour. So we would go out for maybe six weeks mm. in a tour bus. But not like it was when I joined Ozzy in 1981 uh, that would be gone for, for months, year and a half. Yeah, uh, and then for the mental health record, I, I was on the road on a tour bus for a year and a half, and then again with condition critical for about eight months, mm -hmm. and then White Snake. So yeah, yeah, the eighties were the years where we did the touring in buses, but once we Choir Riot uh, reunited in ni in nineteen ninety seven, we started doing it the way that we do it now. Is that we fly to a city and maybe there's like a hub of certain venues. Like a couple of weeks ago, we did one in Texas. So oh, we wow. land in Dallas, then we drive to Houston, then we drive to San Antonio, and then we come home from San Antonio. Yeah. You know? And uh, last week was different. Last week we did uh, West Palm Beach. <clears throat> we flew into West Palm Beach. And then we did the show, and then the next morning we flew to Maryland to do M3 Festival, and then we came home. You know, wow. how, how was and, that festival? Oh, it was great. We did it last year, too. We were the only band to be uh, invited from last year to do it this year. That's and great. it was wonderful. I mean, it's like, uh, it's like uh, you know, class reunion, you know, uh, I get to see oh, a lot of friends that I haven't seen and also people that I play with. I ran yeah. into Brad Gillis, who we played together in Ozzy, and it was great to see <clears> him. <throat> and uh, people like uh, Phil Susan, who also played with Ozzy, bass player, dear friends, because a lot of people have moved away from Los Angeles to mm -hmm. Las Vegas or Nashville. So I don't have the same circle of friends that I, I used to have. Right, they used right. to live here in uh, <clears throat> Los Angeles. Yeah. Now, uh, you did Mars with Rob Rock, and who was on that? Uh, Tony McAlpine. Tony McAlpine, Rob Rock, you, yeah, and, and Tommy Aldrich, and yeah. Tommy Aldrich. How how yeah. is that? Rob Rock is actually not my neighbor, but he lives like twenty minutes from here, and him oh, and wow. I go out. Yeah, we go out to him. 
him and Liza, his wife, and me and my wife, we go out to eat and hang yeah. out. And just yeah. a great guy. I was is trying that in to Florida. Speak. It, yeah. That in Florida? Yeah. 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 Tell, tell him I say hi, please. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, was trying to get him to chime on, but I think he's too busy right now. So that would have been nice, yeah. you know? Yeah. But yeah. No, no, he's a great guy. Yeah. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, I did <clears throat> a show. I sat in for, for the Impalitary bass player mm -hmm. uh, in Korea. So we, I, I, and I've known Chris, of course, Rob. Right. Uh, Chris and I, we were in a band called Annie Metal US. USA, and we played Japan a lot. Mm. So uh, he asked me if I wanted to do this gig. It was a big, big festival in South Korea. Yeah. And uh, it was great. But that was the last time I saw Rob. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He, he was telling me about that, about you playing with him and stuff. Because I told him, I said, Yeah, I'm going to do a podcast with Rudy. He goes, Oh, yeah. Mm. You know, I played with him. We had Mars and we we did we did the show with, with Impelitary and all that. Rob's yes. a great guy. He it's really is guy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, I happen to know that you are an animal lover, right? Uh, I see yeah. on your Facebook you have all yeah. these adopted pet. Adop How'd you get into that? That whole thing. I think it's great. Well, it's, it's 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 very simple. It's I mean, I won't even think about it. I just do it. Uh, it's you know, certain shelter uh, posts come through my feed, and I just reshare it. You know, ah, okay. That's 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 what I do. I mean, I, I I have a lot of respect and admiration for the people who actually are working at the shelters. Mm, yeah, I don't work at a shelter. I I go on the road right. and play and play and play music. But right. the ones that do, I mean, I mean, that is a calling. You know, that really is. is there, there's a lot of. Uh, responsibility of taking care of these uh of of these furry friends who just they might have been dropped for some reason by their owners and then they're scared they have no idea what's happening to them now or if they're if their owners are going to come back or not and it's up to these people to make them feel comfortable until yeah. they hopefully get rescued mm -hmm. you know yeah because it's it's the temperament of the dog or cat is what's going to dictate if, if they're going to get adopted. If it's right. a restless, if it's a restless pet, just because it's afraid, <clears throat> it's in, in, doesn't know what's going on. If they're too restless, yeah, they're they're not gonna. They, whoever's looking to adopt an animal is not gonna feel safe bringing them into their family because they might have small children or sure. other other pets yeah so yeah the we, calmer the, the calmer the uh, the pet is at the shelter the better chance mm -hmm. of them getting rescued yeah we actually rescued a dog we had a dog that was a golden retriever he like he lived like 12 years and he got cancer and then oh. we ended up adopting a pit bull because oh. he just came up to us just like when we were at, we're at the at the Humane Society, he just was looking at us with the puppy dog eyes, and I'm like, "All right, let's take this guy home." So we brought him home. Yeah, and and he's the best dog. The yeah. only thing I don't like about him, he's real protective about my wife. Even with me, I go to hug my wife, or you know, us Latinos pat her on the backside or something. He's like, Arr! he growls at me, you know. Wow. I'm like, hey, dude, chill, man. That, chill. It's my wife. It's okay, you know. But other than that, he's a great dog, man, and mm. I'm, I'm glad we did that. You know, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. What about um, outside of music? What do you What do you do for fun? Do you just is there anything else you got that you have interest in or for fun? Uh, <laughs> it's funny because I I have a I, I used to collect toys years ago, really, and, and yeah, I mean like you know video games and all these. I used to travel and buy all these uh, electronic games because I used to get bored on the road, you know. And uh, you know, you're stuck in a tour bus, and I'm bored, you know. So I had all these electronic games and all stuff, and I just got rid of all of them. I gave them away to oh, to wow. kids, children, children, you know. I had drones and all that, and uh, because see, yeah, I, you know. I'd rather be playing my instrument than playing a video game. 
Yes, sir. Yeah, I do get mentally challenged by a video game. I I do the the instant gratification that I have when I discover something that I can do with the same 12 notes that I've been playing <laughs> for 50 years or more. Yeah. You know, uh, it's, it's something <clears throat> that is, it just gives me so much satisfaction. The fulfillment yeah. It's really a truly a fulfillment, you know? Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. Man. Um, what about, uh, I know you, you, your faith, you know, I know that, you you have faith. Ken was telling me that you don't have a problem talking about. How did all that come about in your life? Well, I I, I was raised Catholic, you know, so to to me it was oh, okay. a matter of of, of <laughs> sifting through what I believe in. You know, I'm I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. I I had a lot of questions as a child in being raised Catholic. And did I get any of the answers I was looking for? <laughs> so I figured, I don't know. I'm not sure about this. But I, I had no, no reflection on my belief in God or, 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 or Christ. It was just mm -hmm. the priests, how they handle right. things or mishandle oh, yeah. things, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and just it's, there's a lot of mystery surrounding the Catholic religion. Mm -hmm. Mysteries with, and, and I get the impression that the, the, <clears throat> the followers are not in on what they know. Mm. You know, there's a lot of hidden occult information oh, yeah. that they do not reveal to the masses. Yeah. And to me, that's really unfair. It is. It is, and and the Catholic movement movement is such a huge movement. Yes, uh, that that people just don't realize. You know, I'm a Christian too, mm. and uh, I I'm I'm one of the guys. I'm open about it. I I share with anybody and everybody. Any everybody who knows mm. me, they know what I'm all about. Mm. You know, and I became a Christian uh, in 1985, and I haven't turned back. You know, my band, Sacred Warrior, we're a Christian band, you know. And it's just neat, man. Um, one more thing about that, um, and then we'll move on to another thing. But were you able to share any of that with Randy or Ozzy or Sharon? Any Anything of the gospel or anything? No, no. As a matter of fact, I, I, was, <laughs> I used to get off the stage and go to my, to my bunk during those tours with Ozzy and, and read the Bible. Oh, wow. Just, just out of gratitude. Not because of a, it's anything happened on stage <clears throat> that I felt like I had to read the Bible and kind of like, you know, cleanse myself. No, I was just out of gratitude for yeah. this phenomenal uh, experience of being in this band. See, I always saw being playing with Ozzy as a blessing. I, mm -hmm. because all, the image that he has is all made up, you know. Oh, it's yeah, like, of course. It's like Christopher Lee playing Dracula. Oh, he's not a vampire. He's, he's just, this is it's Dracula, <laughs> him acting as, as a vampire. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing yeah. was, was with Ozzy. You know. Hey, I, I, do you know Alice Cooper personally? Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. personally, no. Well, you know, he's got his own church. He's got his own right. foundation, you know, helping kids. As a matter of fact, the Choir Riot played at the uh, Christmas pudding <clears throat> this, this, oh, uh, wow. this last year. And I went to do a, uh, what do you call that? That I actually went to talk to the congregation kids at the church, mm -hmm. you know, talking about music and, you know, my, my faith and all of that. And it's Alice Cooper. Yeah. <laughs> you know, come That's on. Great. You know, so, yeah, you have to separate this, this character from the actual individual, you yeah. know, who's actually a Christian, a devout Christian, you know. Yeah. With the church, yeah. and it's all yeah. youth, youth. Uh, uh, what do you call that? It's, it's it's a place where the kids go and hang out, and are being taught music to help them get away from crime, a life of crime. That's really good because yeah, kids, especially today. Well, I mean, for as long as I can remember, but kids now, mm -hmm. it looks like they're just looking for trouble to get into. They're looking for junk, 
And if we don't take the Alice Coopers and, and certain people that are going to bring them in and, and really, if the parents aren't, aren't, aren't really raising them in the right way, they're going to go crazy. They're going to go crazy and do some stuff, man. So it's good that, you know, Alice and stuff. Uh, yeah. Does those yeah. Kind of things. And unfortunately, social media, uh, has a lot of influence on that challenges oh. the kids to like, you know, TikTok challenge to like, okay, do this crazy stuff, you know, whatever it might be. It's dangerous. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it really is, you know? <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so it, it thinks, you know, the more you can have a direct connection with the youth, the mm -hmm. much better. Yeah. They'll get it because first of all, you're showing up. You're there, which means that you care for them. Absolutely. You, people care for them, you know? Mm. So, and then you, you, you reveal to them that you are just like they are mm. and that you were in the same position as they are right now. You were there. And through a relationship, my, my relationship with Christ, it, it guided me through all of the uh, trials and tribulations of mm -hmm. the things that I experienced. You know, it's <clears throat> life. We're here to yeah. experience life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Can you, uh, can you, just off the top of your head, do you have one particular show that just rings in your head that you've done that was just, you always think about it, it was like your best show or favorite show, and why? No. They were all. I mean, there's, there's, there's some pivotal moments. Yeah. But not necessarily my best show. It was, it was shows that, uh, like, let's say, playing the Oz Festival. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, it was a challenge logistically, but we did it. And, uh, but every show to me, it's, 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 <clears throat> I, it's like a clean slate. I gotta, you know, I gotta try to paint, paint that, that masterpiece all over again. Yeah. No, I you love know? that you said that because, because really it, it goes back to what you were saying earlier that every day you're auditioning. Yeah, absolutely. That is so powerful. That is so powerful, yeah. you know? Yeah. You know, especially nowadays, I mean, when I was growing up in the 60s, rock and roll had only been not around for not even 10 years yet. Wow. Think about it. Rock and roll started like around 55. <clears throat> the term rock and roll got coined. And right. then, you know, Little Richard and Chuck Berry, Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis and all that. By the time that the Beatles came out in 64, that's not even 10 years. Right? Yeah. So, so all of a sudden, there's a single generation following rock and roll. Then you get to the 70s. Oh, that's second generation now. You oh, get yeah. 80s, three generations. You got 50s, 60s, one generation, 60, 70, 70, 80, right? Okay. So you might have you might have people that were listening to 60s music getting into the 80s still. But now you have we have about five or six generations of rock and roll. And when I go to a show, the older generation might be familiar with what I've done in the past, right? right? Mm -hmm. And they look and they look at me like saying, well. Let's see. Okay, it's been 40 years for you doing this. Show me what you got. Yeah. Right? And I got to show him exactly what I had 40 years ago. Because yeah. otherwise, what's the point of me being there? Right? Okay. Then you got the kids who've never seen me play before. It's brand new. Okay, yeah. well, I heard, I heard of this guy because <laughs> I've seen videos of him on, on YouTube. So let me see what you got. It's yeah. exactly the same thing. So, uh, so I, I'm auditioning for the, somebody who saw me in the 80s and somebody who's seeing me for the first time right now and so everybody true. else in between. Yeah. So I got to prove myself every single show. Yeah. No, I love that, man. I love that you said that because realistically, I mean, that's kind of how I am. It, you know, I'm a vocalist. But when I rehearse, I'm rehearsing not just the songs. I'm rehearsing what I'm going to say in between the songs, oh, what yeah. I'm going to do, and depending on where we're playing, Germany or, or, or the States, you're going to say something different. And it's the same kind of thing you yeah. have to, it's called preparation, yeah. you know, yeah. and if you quit preparing, you're going to, yeah. your show's yeah. going to suck. And yeah. 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 
Yeah, and the and the levels of shows that we do are mostly casinos and fairs, some amphitheaters like the one we did at M3, not mm -hmm. the gigantic stadium with the with the massive screen type of shows. Because those, if you look at the stage, <clears throat> there's not a whole lot of movement going on. It's what's going on on the screens, which all the fast edits and all the camera movement, which makes everything look like highly exciting. Yeah. But basically what's going on on stage is not, you know, yeah, that there's I, not too much activity going on. Yeah. I just went and saw Disturbed in Nashville a few months ago, and they had all their light towers, all their light frames, you know, uh, they were all doing all kinds of this and they were burning everything. But the band just pretty much just stood there, just like you said. Yeah, yeah. You know, so they give yeah. you all these visuals to make it. And obviously, yeah. you, you're going to like it, you know, but it, it's it's at a different level where 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 we were, because I'm, yeah. you know, in the same era as you versus all the new stuff down. Bands, bands don't move around. They don't do a whole lot anymore, you know. They're relying on the visuals and stuff. So, you know, yeah. I feel like you're, you're getting kind of cheated, you know. Um, well, yeah. Uh... I mean, you know what? It, as long as the audience is enjoying it, yeah, that's that's all that matters, you know. But since we don't have all those bells and whistles, and that's the only way I know how to do it, I got to get into the music. <clears throat> I, you know, it's to me, it's always now. And I got into the music like I was playing at the Starwood with Choir Riot with Randy Rhodes and Kevin Dubro. You know that version of the band. Yep. As yep. as much as I got into the music later on with Ozzy, with a gigantic castle behind us. See, the, mm -hmm. at first sight, the castle became our our nemesis. <laughs> Randy looked at it and go, "Oh my God, <laughs> people people are just gonna leave talking about this stupid <laughs> thing here." So you know that gave us more motivation to like oh, yeah. take the attention away from this castle and look at the band. Look at yeah, us. Yeah, man. Yeah. We're, we're really working it out here, you know. There's a lot of passion in what we're doing. We're not just standing around in front of this castle, you know. Yeah, play. yeah. And 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 that has been my my rule. This is my that's what I do. It's not even a rule. That, that's it's my consciousness as a mm. performer. That yeah, that and then I parlayed that one from into Quiet Riot. Took it to a whole different level, then into Whitesnake, to you know, and then with Dio, and it's always been about giving everything you got on that stage. Yeah, and just yeah. and just leave it there, you know. Yeah, every and night. You, yeah, and you have to, you have to, even if yeah. you're tired or sick or whatever. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Um, yeah, my buddy Dave Carter, uh, he sent me this thing. Uh, I didn't even know that you did this. You do a uh, Rudy Sarzo show support for the Music Matters Challenge. Rudy's a legendary musician known for a quiet riot, Ozzy Osbourne, yada, yada. We all have a story where music positively impacted our lives. Join Sarzo, Rudy, and sharing your story and enter music to win challenges. You still do that? People share their stories with you and you, they can win. Yeah, you know what it is? It, the, what is the, that? Ge the genesis of the Music Challenge was started by John Andrasic. Was the uh, was actually uh, five for fighting? That's his band. Okay. And okay, now John and I go back to like over about thirty five years ago. Mm -hmm. We both uh, used to, you know, we had like a weekend vacation property at uh, this place called the Malibu Bay Club in in Malibu on the beach. It was like a beach beachfront property. Yeah, and we would hang out, and he was just starting out. He was kind of like finding his way through music, writing songs, and getting a musical direction, and all of that. So we've been friends, <laughs> ever, you know, since then for thirty-five years. So he's wow. the one that started this organization, which is actually to to raise money to give schools music teachers to pay oh. for it. It, pay, wow. it funds music education in schools. Uh, in addition to, to that one, I'm also involved with Education Through Music Los Angeles, which is another organization. And this one is for the L.A. school system. 
Mm. The other one, John and Drastic's uh, Fight for Fighting, is yeah. more of a of a national. But this one, uh, the uh, Education Through Music, Los Angeles, is more local. And I'm wow. involved with them, you know. Yeah. That's really neat, man. Like I said, you just never know things about people, right? <laughs> well, uh, last know, question. Music education, I mean, at whatever level, even if it just inspires a, a, a kid to instead of going, going home from school and getting into trouble, just go to your room and, and play the guitar. You know, play guitar yeah. with your friends down, down the street, just like we used to do. Maybe yeah. inspired to become a songwriter, you know, especially mm -hmm. girls. Girls have, you know, they like to keep diaries and they kind of like, you know, Taylor Swift, all their songs are about her personal life, you know. Yeah. So yeah. they find like that's a really <clears throat> the best way to to communicate. You know, they're actually communicating yeah. with a higher power. And then it translates to to an audience of kids right. that feel exactly the same way that like they do. And they connect. It's, it's all about connecting. And music yeah. is, is is the best conduit for connection mm -hmm. with humanity that there is. Yeah. That's yeah. why yeah. when you yeah. go to church when you go to church, psalms are song, music. You enter churches, there's music. Music brings us all together, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's loud in my ear. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's really neat. Um, Rudy, um, as you have progressed in music through all these years, you've met a lot of people, and you, and I'm sure you shared uh, your life and your styles and everything with people. To the person that's just watching today that has no idea who you are, or doesn't know much about music and any advice for them that you just want to pour your heart out to them. Cause I get a lot of listeners that aren't musicians. There yeah. are other things, but I, you, in my opinion, you're a very intelligent man. You have a lot of great stuff to say. And yeah. if there was anything that, that you could share. Yeah. Music just like religion is something that, uh, unless somebody's seeking the information, mm -hmm. You cannot make somebody a religious person or a musician. They have to like right. gravitate toward that. Right. You know? and, and for those of us who gravitate to faith and music, uh, <clears throat> it's, it, it's, it's a journey. Mm. You know, uh, when I first started playing, I didn't even know there was a music industry. I knew that I was buying records, but I didn't know what that meant. You know, I listen to music. I buy records because I listen to music. I didn't know anything yeah. about that. There's a producer, an engineer. Then there's a there's a marketing department. There's a promotion guy that goes from station to station. I'm talking about oh, traditional yeah. record companies. You know. Oh yeah. I just play music. First of all, when I saw the Beatles and the girls were going crazy for the Beatles, I said, "That's I want that." You know, I want that adulation. And uh, but then I fell in love with music. It's it's uh, I fell in love with the sincerity of it all. It's very sincere. Mm -hmm. Music is uh, music doesn't lie to you. Right, right. You know, it's very honest. Uh, whether you're good or bad at it, you soon find out. And then if you're bad <laughs> and you want to get better. Just spend, you know, you got to give it those 10,000 hours to get to that certain level. You know, it's a, then, then it becomes a commitment, a lifelong commitment. And then, right. then someday you might have the identity. Yes, I am a musician. Doesn't mean that that's, <clears throat> it's kind of like a doctor. You get a degree and, you know, you're a doctor, but you still yeah. have to keep studying. Because That's there's right. new, new medicines and new um, you know discoveries in medicine and all that, so you got to stay on top of it. Yeah, you know, it's a never-ending journey. Yeah, yeah, that's neat, man. Yeah. Well, Rudy, I'm I'm really honored that you took the time to do this uh, podcast with me. I know you do a lot of them, you know, and I I, I try to make mine a little different than than others, you know, and ask questions and stuff. And uh, uh, if you ever get down the Florida area, me, you, and Rob need to go get some Cuban coffee, okay? <laughs> okay. Hola, Juan Valdez. Buenos días. Buenos días. Disfruta un buen café. Gracias, señor. Adiós. Adiós. Ah. 
I, yeah, buddy. Yeah. I have so some listen, every morning. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Rudy, yeah. thanks, man. I really Thank appreciate you. it. You're great. Buddy. Thank you. My pleasure. And awesome. uh, yeah, send me a link when, once it's ready to go. Yeah, I sure will. I sure will. Okay. Thank you. All right, God, God, bless God bless you, buddy. Take care. Bye -bye. You too. Bye-bye.